Hey ghouls and gals, welcome back to my channel. My name is Taylor and today's video is going to be my top 10 favorite books that I read in 2020. Now, this list was very hard to make for 2020, which is a really good sign. I had about like a short list of 20 books that I could have put on here, but I felt like that would be just a little bit too lengthy, so I narrowed it down to 10. I had a really good reading year in 2020. I did kind of sort these in some sort of order, but I'm gonna be honest, like a lot of these could be moved wherever on this list. It's not exactly like in order, just because I read so many absolutely wonderful books this year. But without further ado, let's just jump into it. So these are my top 10 favorite books of 2020. So the first book that we're going to talk about today is Catherine House by Elizabeth Thomas. This is a dark academia sort of horror story about a young woman who gets inducted into Catherine House, which is a very prestigious college where pretty much all of America's greats have supposedly come from. Now Catherine House is very unique as a rigorous college setting in that you enter into the Catherine House compound and you can't have any contact with the outside world until you leave. So this sets the scene for some very spooky, kind of culty sort of dark academia things to happen. Now I read this one as an audiobook. I would really recommend you reading it this way because it is such a surreal experience. I like comparing this to a book that really feels like a dream in a lot of aspects. And what I mean by that is that this book has a very heavy atmosphere and it spends a lot of time with characters inside characters heads and there isn't really so much of a plot um, and I know that either really excites people or really draws people away from the book that's okay I don't think everyone is going to like this one but what I thought was really cool about Catherine House is just the impeccable ambiance and atmosphere and really eerie vibes that this book gives off which was very good for a kind of I don't know if this is technically classified as horror but it's very much like a horror, sci-fi, darker sort of speculative fiction book. If you're a person who really likes closed endings and kind of know everything that happened and have no mysteries unsolved by the end of books, you're really not going to like this one. It definitely doesn't like resolve almost at all, but that really, really worked for me. This book can potentially be very triggering. Um, I will mention to someone whose mental health maybe isn't the best right now, or if you are struggling in your mental health, maybe... Um, um, put this down just because I thought that the main character, I know a lot of people don't like this main character and um, it, she isn't like the most likable, but I thought the main character was an absolutely wonderful depiction of sometimes what can happen when you feel like everything is going right in your life and you still have depressive tendencies and you still feel burnt out and just your mental health isn't cooperating with you and where you want to go versus where your mental health is kind of putting a barrier up with yourself. So I thought that was very relatable but definitely I wouldn't have been able to read this just because it kind of hit a little too close to home had I been in like a worse mental state so definitely like trigger warnings for that. This book definitely deals with a lot of mental health aspects and I do think it does it really really well but that could potentially be triggering so just heads up for that but I thought this was like a really good dark academia with some horror and some sort of sci-fi elements to it. The next book on my list is going to be the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slang Vampire Empires by Grady Hendrix and this is a horror novel about a group of housewives in the 1990s South who get together and they have a book club and they focus on like true crime and horror and mystery novels and our main character Patricia she really feels like her life is just not where she wanted it to be she feels very constrained by the time and her expectations as being a mother and a wife before feeling like she gets to be her own person so this book club and her friends there are very dear to her and so this is like her one escapist sort of place in her life and everything is going okay in her life until a mysterious stranger moves into town and he might be a monster as described in the books that they read like John Wayne Gacy or Ted Bundy or he might be something a little more of a supernatural type of monster. This is one of my most anticipated releases of the year and I absolutely loved it. This was just just really fun. I feel like Grady Hendrix always has that perfect balance of true horror and like disturbing scenes and comedy um, and not necessarily comedy comedy but like 
funny moments and characters you can root for and enough lighthearted and sentimental moments in between those horrific moments that the books really leave an emotional impact on you. So I loved that and Grady Hendrix said he wanted to write this book kind of pitting his mom against a mythical creature like Dracula because you know moms are really the unsung heroes of all of our childhoods for the most part if you're lucky enough to have a wonderful mom. Um, you don't really realize until you grow up and get older how much um, your parents in general if you're lucky enough to have good parents um, but how much like your moms do for you and kind of having moms in here being the protagonists as like the ultimate underdog especially like conventions in society kind of putting them in more of a sheltered and lower spot in terms of traditional power and then having them be pitted against a vampire was just a really fun dynamic. I really enjoyed the vampire like lore in here. I felt like a lot of scenes in here were really good nods and subtle little nods to vampire lore and like vampire great stories that have come before this one while also putting like a fresh spin on it. The vampires in here are so gross and so gory and like not romanticized at all, which I really love. So it's definitely nice to see a vampire that seems like more of a threat and isn't just like a bad boy love interest. I thought that was really well done in here and I really enjoyed this one. The next book on this list is another debut, which is actually really cool. Looking through this list, I have quite a few debuts on here, which is really neat because um, I'm finding a lot of new to me authors this year. And that would be The Space Between Worlds by Micaiah Johnson. This book is so much fun. I think I read this in like a single sitting. This is definitely a sci-fi that is really good for beginners to this genre. In a lot of ways it feels like more of a dystopian thriller than like a hard sci-fi novel. So I feel like this is very digestible for people who are looking to kind of dip their toe into the water of sci-fi and aren't really sure where to start. But this book is following a set in the future earth where we have five finally figured out the secrets behind multi-dimensional travel and being able to go to different universes in our multiverse, but there's only one catch to this, that you cannot travel to an Earth counterpart where your counterpart is still alive. Now, in this futuristic society, of course, we have really messed up our planet and a lot of resources on it, so this multi-dimensional travel was created for people to go to different Earths and and different like timelines in Earth to collect resources from different Earths and also to kind of see mistakes that they might have made to try and fix the timeline for the better. Our main character Kara is exceptionally good at dying, which means that herself has died on so many other different Earths that she can travel to an astonishingly large amount of Earths, which makes her the perfect traveler for these type of expeditions, which makes her very valuable in the eyes of this company that is doing all of this travel. Kara very much sees this multiverse travel as a job and a way of moving up in society and doesn't really think too much of the repercussions to it until things start getting a little bit strange and her missions start becoming more and more bizarre and a little bit insidious and she has to try and figure out if her job and her security is worth the trade-off of maybe being complicit in something that has deeper ramifications for her world and other worlds like hers. So like I kind of touched on before, this is very fast paced and like very enjoyable. I'm not a big sci-fi reader. I'm starting to get into the genre and I definitely wasn't lost by the technologies in here. They're definitely explained enough and I feel like multiverse travel is something that's in like the public consciousness enough where I wasn't really confused by any of the concepts in here. This deals with themes of like creating your own fate, creating your own destiny, how much you can interpret and change your lot in life and really progress in society based on how society views you and where you were born into society. And also this features a really fun sapphic romance that is not at the forefront of the story um, because I'm definitely not a big romance person 
but it was like a side part of the story that was like a really nice added bonus to this book that I didn't know that it was sapphic going into it, which is really cool. So if you're looking to dip your toe into sci-fi or if you already like sci-fi and you're looking for a fast paced fun read that deals with a lot of topics in a really poignant way and also just like a really fun way, this is definitely a good book for you. Book number seven on my list is also another sci-fi I know, who am I? I was surprised too, but that is going to be The First Sister by Lyndon A. Lewis. The First Sister is the first book in a trilogy that takes place in the future where humans have kind of messed up Earth. Um, again, I feel like there are some themes that I'm finding that I'm really enjoying in sci-fi. But in contrast to The Space Between Worlds, this one is definitely more of a space opera, so it has a ton of like Star Wars vibes in the best possible way. I mean that as a compliment. This is just like really fun. It does take place like in our solar system, which is really cool. I feel like normally in space operas, you tend to see like just a larger sort of like galaxy being explored. But I thought this also was like really accessible for beginners like me to sci-fi because the planets that this takes place on, there's only four um, that are really mentioned, at least in this book. So it feels very accessible and it is in our solar system. So there's not too much of a learning curve in terms of learning different planets and different species named. This is very much like a smaller sort of introduction and also just like the technology and culture. I feel like this is supposed to take place, I forget the exact year, but in the not too distant future. So a lot of this definitely I could see the technology being used today or being created even in like the next 50 to 100 years we'll say. But the first sister is about a conflict between two kind of branches of humanity that have really split off and taken place after Earth has been kind of abandoned. There are still people living there but it's mostly uninhabitable. Humanity is kind of split off into two different sects and they're just kind of fighting for resources and the right to kind of have their way in the solar system. This is very much both sides of the war. You're following people on both sides of the war and it's very much an exploration of are there actually any good guys versus bad guys in a war or is it more nuanced than that and the three different characters that we're following are all struggling to figure out if they actually believe in what they're fighting for if they believe in causes and if the causes that they're fighting for are actually just and this was just like a really cool future space world that felt real it felt like this could happen i mean obviously i don't want the events here to happen necessarily but just like the futuristic space technology and all that, it felt very real. Really excellently written for a debut. I don't see a lot of people talking about this book and I think it's absolutely wonderful. I feel like this has a very, very wide range of people this would appeal to because it's a great space opera, but it also does kind of feel like a book that would appeal to fantasy fans um, and just people who maybe don't read a lot of sci-fi but want to dip their toe in the genre. This also has a lot of really excellent rep in terms of queer characters and gender identity. We do have a non-binary main character, we do have um, a sapphic main character, and just a lot of things in this world that are also really cool is that while it's not like utopian and just not a part of society and like tensions and all of that, but being queer and being different is very much like an easier thing to be in the society, which is also really fun to read about. There is some slight romance, but that's definitely not the point of this series. It's more about like friendship relationships and just human connection with different people that's focused on in this story and I just really like reading about queer characters because the rep is great and diverse in this book but it's just like a part of each character it's not a part of their arc which I really like I just like seeing people existing and having those labels and not having that be a part of their character arc which is really cool so I highly recommend this one the second book the second rebel I think something like that is coming out this summer and I'm really excited to get to it out of all these I probably say I feel like this one is probably the most slept on out of this whole entire list and I also feel like this one is one of the books at least on my list that has the most widespread potential so I definitely recommend you picking this up and giving it a try if you haven't already. The next book on my list that is in my favorite books of 2020 is going to be the monstrous graphic novel series by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. I picked volume one 
I'm unsure of whether this is my favorite volume in the series. There are five volumes currently out, and I did read the first three volumes initially in a bind up. I'm kind of cheating a little bit because I kind of just want to combine volumes one through four and just have that as a entity on this list of favorites, but this is an extraordinary graphic novel series, probably my favorite graphic novel series that I've ever read. This is a steampunk fantasy with lots of horror elements. It very much feels like an epic fantasy in terms of scale though, which is really cool. The artwork is absolutely incredible, but this follows Micah Halfwolf and her gang of found family friends. This has a really good found family aspect if you're interested in that. It's really well done here, but this is following a world where there are humans and there are arcanics, which are like anthropomorphic animals. So like imagine Disney's Robin Hood or Zootopia, like that's what the Arcanics are like. They're animals, they like act like people. So there's people, Arcanics, there are witches. There are also people like our protagonist, Micah Halfwolf, that are like half Arcanic and half human. So they have like some animal characteristics, maybe like some more animalistic senses or ears or just like different features that kind of mark them as other. And then there are monstrous gods and monsters and mythical creatures creatures that may or may not be coming back to the world when everyone thought that they had vanished. So this is taking place. The largest conflict so far at this point in the series is a war is brewing between humans and the Arcanics. The Arcanics and the humans have never really gotten along because they see each other as very, very different, but the Arcanics magic is waning at the same time as humans are building all of these technologies and putting them ahead when previously the Arcanics were living like a better quality of life than humans. They are fighting each other. They're trying to fight each other to extinction. The humans are trying to eradicate the Arcanics and these half human, half Arcanic people that they consider monstrosities. And a war is brewing that threatens to be very, very large and very detrimental to everyone involved. It's going to be a very total war, but there are some things that are brewing and there are some deeper, darker entities at play that might be unleashed if this war happens. So Micah Halfwolf has to try and solve some mysteries surrounding her past as well as this war in general and try and stop a war from happening before it goes to a war on a cosmic scale. This series is so good. Characterization is wonderful. The artwork is absolutely stunning. Each single panel is so detailed and the art style is absolutely exquisite. And and also just this whole entire world is so immersive and just so creative and wonderful. And I will say, if you're just jumping in, this does jump you into the conflict. And you might feel, especially after the first volume, that you have a lot of questions about the world and the mechanics. There's not a lot of info dumping in here, but just trust the process and know that things about the world will be revealed to you little by little when you need it, which is really cool. Um, it might feel a little bit dis orienting at first, especially because this world is so large and so different from our own and you want to know everything from like the first couple of pages, you're going to feel very, very lost, but it keeps getting revealed to you little by little, volume by volume, more mysteries become answered for you. This is just so cool. I love it. There are just so many wonderful fantasy tropes in here that I absolutely love. Um, and just the found family aspects, the badass female protagonists, the artwork, it's just it's simply wonderful. It's very dark. It's very gruesome, but there are also like this series has made me laugh out loud multiple times. The banter between the characters is absolutely wonderful. This is very rare in the sense that I feel like the world building and the characters are both excellent and the art style is also excellent, which I feel like in graphic novels, just because people's different art styles are so different and so varied, which is cool, but I feel like sometimes I'll find an art style I really like and not really like the content or vice versa. So it's really cool to find a series that just really ticks off all three of those boxes for me. The next book on my list is Certain Dark Things by Silvia Moreno Garcia, and this is a darker fantasy. Um, I feel like 
could be classified as horror in some aspects as well. But this is a darker fantasy about a young vampire and she is the heiress to like this vampire gang um, and she's being hunted down by a rival vampire gang. So she has to try and flee Mexico City and escape to where there are more of her vampire kind um, and she has to enroll the help of a very unlikely source, a young street boy who has only read about epic stories in comic books and literature and never expects to find himself in the middle of a grand adventure. This book is so wonderful. Again, it's also another vampire tale where vampires are just done so right. It's ridiculous. It's so cool. So first of all, this is set in near future Mexico City in a world where vampires exist us humans know about them. While some types are powerful, their power is more like gang related and in the shadows related because they're also persecuted because let's be honest, while we all love vampires, none of us wants to be killed and eaten by one, I feel like. So this futuristic world deals with those topics of vampires kind of very much in the shadows, but as a day-to-day -day sort of life occurrence. And there are so many different types of vampires dealing with different types of vampire lore. So this book is really cool in that you don't just get one type of vampire, you get just all of them, which is so cool to read about. The only like criticism that I have of this book is that it is a standalone and I just, this could honestly be like a whole full-fleshed series. This was just so fun and it, it's like gory. There are definitely some darker sort of action moments, definitely trigger warning for body horror, just in like the typical vampire way. There's definitely a lot of gore in those aspects and like if you don't like you know draining blood and vampires killing people to eat them and there's also some like vampire mind control as well I feel like kind of typical tropes in vampire lore trigger warnings for that so it does get very gory at times and very bloody but this is just really fun it feels like an action movie I would say almost kind of like an underworld if you've seen those movies situation going on in terms of pacing and just the plot of just really high stakes action-y sort of scenes between vampires and humans. This was just a lot of fun. I did toy between putting either Mexican Gothic in this place or just keeping certain dark things, but I figure Mexican Gothic has so much hype, so much well-deserved hype, because it was also on my list, like my short list of honorable mentions for my favorite books of this year, but I feel like this one never really gets talked about, and I have heard that this isn't in print anymore. I got it from my library, um, but apparently um, just because Mexican Gothic and Gods of Jade and Shadow did so well, Silvia Moreno Garcia is able to print this book again, so I believe this is being re-released this year. So definitely keep an eye out for it. This is one that is just a lot of fun and definitely one where after I read it, I didn't think it would make its way on this list, but sitting back and thinking at the end of the year, I can't get it out of my head. I keep thinking about just how much fun this story was and I'd definitely reread it around Halloween time. It would be really, really fun. So definitely keep an eye out for this book coming back in print this year. This was a lot of fun to read and if you liked the writing style of Mexican Gothic, but you didn't like how maybe it was more character and atmospheric than plot driven, maybe check this one out because I definitely say out of the two Silvia Moreno Garcia books that I've read this one is definitely plot heavier as opposed to Mexican Gothic. All right now we're finally down to my top four favorite books of the year. The next book on this list is going to be Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. This is one that really snuck in at the last moment. This is one of the very last books that I read in 2021 and I just this was an absolute delight. So this is kind of like a dark academia book also kind of just a modern gothic book that also weirdly has like some horror satire slash meta horror sort of aspects to it. So this takes place in two different timelines. There's one timeline that takes place in like 1910 or something like that and then another that takes place in present day and the present day timeline is actually chronicling a movie production that is being filmed about the events of the other timeline in this book. So it switches back and forth between those two timelines in here. I switched back and forth between reading this physical book and listening to the audiobook because both of them are wonderful and sometimes for a book I can say like this is the way the book is supposed to be 
read um, either physically or via audio this one could go either way because this book is absolutely gorgeous there are full page illustrations in here it's very much told in like a dear reader sort of format um, like a classic or a classic gothic book which was really fun I love that sort of setup my number one takeaway from this book that I want to impress upon people before you pick up this book to read if you liked the haunting of Bly Manor TV show you're going to love this they're very very similar if you didn't like it you're not going to like this and I only say that because both of them are horror they're definitely horror but they're very much like character studies and slower and experiencing relationships um, both of them are very gay by the way this is so sapphic it's wonderful so it does have those elements in there of in both timelines in both the timeline in like 1902 or whatever and modern day there's a lot of sapphic characters and some relationships in here which is really cool um, but both of them are very very atmospheric and character driven and just slower and quieter. This book I'd say more than any other book that I read this year has characters that I feel like I could meet on the street or that I could really feel like they're real people that I would meet. They're so nuanced. They feel so much like real people. The characterization and the atmosphere are absolutely wonderful. The plot is where I feel like a lot of people are going to have issues with this one and this is definitely a book where the five star reviews on Goodreads and the one star reviews on Goodreads are saying the same exact things. So it's very polarizing. This definitely feels like I already said before, the characters are so real to life and almost the plot feels very real to life as well. And where, don't go into this expecting like a lot of conclusion. Don't go in expecting anything to be tied up with a neat little bow at the end because it very much reflects real life in a lot of ways, especially in the plot structure and the fact that like life is not always a perfect, easy narrative that has sense and that makes like a cohesive story. It very much feels like that true to life where you're kind of left with answers and not everything works out sometimes the way you want it to. So I definitely wouldn't go in expecting like anything very plot heavy. This is just just exploring characters and just exploring like a really fun atmospheric gothic atmosphere which really really worked for me not gonna work for everyone and that's absolutely okay I just this was absolutely incredible and just such a fun reading experience like I already want to go back and reread this from the beginning and maybe see if there are like some subtle little things that maybe I didn't notice before and I just really loved to a lot of the characters in here in the modern day story are like exactly my age and kind of going through some similar things that I'm going through right now in terms of career and feeling like technically you know you're 25 26 27 that's not old it's no longer young which is stupid but it's no longer young considered in society's standpoints especially when it comes to the arts and creating and wanting to create and we're feeling like your window is very very small and then just kind of feeling like almost already burnt out in your mid to late 20s and feeling like okay if you're not a wonderkind then you're kind of already past that point and you have to work harder and you're not really sure um what you want to do for the rest of your life which seems scary and just it's a very weird time to be alive um and so I liked the discussions in here about that as well especially wanting to be in a creative field as a career and I really like this kind of limbo space of being in your mid to late 20s that's just very bizarre and like a weird time so I really enjoyed those discussions in here as well and yeah it's just it's a gorgeous book I absolutely love it um it's not gonna be for everyone but it definitely has a special place in my heart gonna give my left hand a break from holding up books because um I read a lot of tomes there are a lot of tomes on this list and my hand's getting tired but the next book on this list is going to be The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab this was a surprise to me this is my first V.E. Schwab book this is the story of a woman named Adeline LaRue and she is born in France in a period of time Time over really if you're a woman you are born you get married you have babies you're a wife your mother and you die probably at the age of like 25 in childbirth or maybe like 30 or 40 as an old crone um, so not the most exciting life Adeline definitely does not want this for herself and she very much fights against conventions as much as she can in the time period but eventually her family is going to marry her off to a man that is a lot of years her senior that already has children wants to have more children and she just sees this life 
and does not want it. So she runs away and she prays to the gods that appear after dark, which is something you are never supposed to do, but she is so desperate she does it anyway. She makes a Faustian bargain with an otherworldly sort of being and they give her immortal life, but she's doomed to be forgotten by everyone she ever meets. She doesn't know the extent of this when she makes this bargain. She only wants a life that is just for herself and that's exactly what she gets because no one else can enter her life and she can't make any single mark on the world. She can't write her own name when she enters a room and meets people once she leaves it. The instant that she goes out of someone's eyesight they forget her completely which is a very sad existence. And so she goes on living from 1700s France to 2016, 2014 or 2016 New York City living this very isolated existence until she meets someone that recognizes her and she has to figure out what that means in terms of her curse and maybe potentially turning her life around for the better. This book absolutely blew me away. It is so quotable. It is written in such a beautiful way. I absolutely loved the pacing of this. It's definitely not going to be for everyone, but it was very slow, very contemplative. This is definitely a love letter to art and the role that art plays and just how much human connection and art make a life worth living and just make our human experience and what makes life wonderful um which i just it was absolutely beautifully written this is probably like the most quotable book this definitely feels like a modern classic i feel like this one is definitely going to be a classic in years to come it's just it's written that way i feel like almost it's very beautiful it's wonderful storytelling it feels like a fairy tale and a classic and it's written amazingly well this is gorgeous this is heartbreaking i did have a little bit of issue with the ending but at the same time i can't think of a better way this book could have ended that's not really a downside i think it is just like a downside of any book that deals with such a long sprawling expanse of time that it's always going to feel like a rush ending because you're going through centuries and you have to end it sometime. This was just wonderful and it's going to sit with me for a very long time. It made me feel things. Addie was wonderful but I absolutely really loved Henry as well and just um, as someone who struggles um, and has struggled with a lot of things that Henry struggles with in this book. I think this book is done beautifully well describing mental health. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier on in this video though, if you are struggling mentally, um, I definitely look up trigger warnings for this book because this definitely hit me very hard and very close to home um, and I feel like that kind of gets glossed over. If you have ever dealt with depression, suicidal ideation, anxiety, just loneliness, um, I I just really would be careful in picking this up and go into it very wary and in a good headspace because it does deal with those topics and I feel like I don't see that part of this book talked about enough but I, I absolutely thought that um, this is a love story but that really focuses on the two people growing and loving themselves and having a romance that makes you a better person but that doesn't make you as a person if that makes sense. It was beautifully told, beautifully written, and this was my very first V.E. Schwab book so um <laughs> I'm a little nervous that I may have read her best thing that she's ever written first but I definitely do want to check out more by this author because this just it was so impactful to me and absolutely stunning writing. The next book was a book that I was very surprised. Um, Number one, I liked so much. Number two, it made it on this list. And number three, it made it to the top of this list. But as I was thinking of books that not only did I enjoy, but like the feelings and emotions that it evoked in me um, and what it did for me personally outside of the reading experience this year, I had to put it this high. I had to put it on the list. And that is going to be Crescent City Book One, House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J Mass. First of all, this is just like by itself a really cool, really immersive adult urban fantasy that is that feels like a high fantasy but has an urban setting which is really cool. I know at least the majority of fantasy that I read tends to be definitely very medieval and very like old timey sort of Tolkien inspired-esque sort of timeline going on so this was really cool to read that had that epic other world feeling but was very modern um and done in a really really cool way. Now this book is up very high on this list not only because I enjoyed it but I bought this book um, the very last trip that I took to Target with my partner before we went 
on lockdown in March. I wasn't even planning on reading this book this year, guys. Um, that's how like surprising this is, that it's in my top 10 books of the year. But I saw that this is a very chunky book. I was like, you know what? I need some escapist reading because this might be a tough month. <laughs> Joke's on me, the lockdown went a lot further than any of us ever anticipated. But this book, I picked it up and it just really transported me away um, from everything. And this is the first book in a long time that I felt like just utterly and completely I felt myself being taken in to another world and I felt like the pure joy of reading that I did as a kid. I love books. I love reading. I read a ton. Um, but I just feel like it's a very special book how my reading now has definitely changed um, and I feel like we're all kind of trying to chase that feeling as little kids where you were just reading and you were so excited to read and just have that childish of excitement of maybe staying up past your bedtime trying to sneak a flashlight in a book under the covers and reading um, late into the night, late into the night for a kid at least. Um, that is just like the kind of joy that this book gave me. That being said, there are like, there is adult content content in here, um, so don't think it's like middle grade or anything. Um, it's definitely adult and very mature. Just It just gave me that nose in a book joy that you feel as a kid, which I just really loved. I also really love the themes in here of grief and getting help after a loss and friendship that really transcends other relationships and that really wonderful once in a lifetime kind of best friendship you can have with someone. I thought that was done really well. I'd love to see it in more books. Um, there is obviously a romance in here um, because it is Sarah J Maas and she writes a lot of fantasy romance, but I really did feel like it almost kind of took second string to a lot of other themes that I felt like were more important in here. At least it Maybe it wasn't second string, but there were so many other moving parts that it didn't really feel like just a fantasy romance. It definitely felt like other relationships were explored and built up just as much as the romantic one, which is really cool because I feel like that's something that's missing out is where you will get like romantic relationships built up and have a really cool character dynamic between two characters but you don't get like friendship dynamics and brother and sister dynamics and a lot of those sometimes fall by the wayside when you have romance in a book and it was not the case here. I felt like Bryce's relationships with her stepbrother and with her friends were really wonderful and really nuanced and different and fun that I am actually not the biggest fan of her love interest in here but I'm really excited just to see where this world goes and where the conflict goes and where Sarah J Maas builds upon next in this really really incredibly wonderfully immersive world. So this is also another book where I've just been thinking about it like all year and I want to do a reread but I'm waiting until closer to when the second book comes out but this is one where I felt like I could have finished this one and then jumped right back in for a reread. Like it was just a lot of fun and it was definitely like the perfect escapist read for 2020 for me. And we are finally here to the very last book that I have on this list and you know, I feel like we can guess if uh, we're not new to the channel what book it is. And honestly, I read all three books in the trilogy this year and I wanted to put them all on this list, but that would have been a little bit repetitive. So I only put my favorite book in the trilogy on this list and that is going to be The Burning God by R.F. Kuang, the third and final book in the Poppy War trilogy. This is my new favorite book of all time. This series is like one of my favorite series of all time. Like it's up there. So my favorite series are the His Dark Material series and this series. Both of them I absolutely love. This book was so, so good. I'm just gonna put it down so the lighting stays okay, but I just absolutely love this series. In my opinion, the Poppy War series only gets better with each book, and this third and final book was like, it's a rough ending. I'm not gonna lie, this book destroyed me. I bawled at it. I, I cried for a long time about it, and sometimes I still think about what happens in this book and get genuinely really, really upset. Um, but that being said, I really can't think of a better way or a more tonally perfect way that this book could have ended. It was absolutely flawlessly written and just really built upon the first book and the second book to make just a wonderful conclusion to a trilogy. This book made me cry, this book had me tearing up, this book made me rage at characters, this book made me just laugh out loud. Honestly, it did. Like, the banter between the characters that we know and love are just, it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, this series, like, I love it for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is the characterization is so wonderful. It has one of my favorite character tropes 
pairings, which is, it's not a romantic pairing, but it's the dynamic of an absolutely feral woman and then a golden retriever man put together, Katai and Rin. I just, I absolutely love them. They're not romantically involved. They're just very, very best friends and they're just absolutely that dynamic and I love it. I love all the characters in here, even when I hate them. I loved Venka. I love Naja, even though I hate Naja. I don't really know how I feel about him. I love Rin. She's one of the most compelling characters that I've ever read about. I just love this and I feel like um, as I go from like number 10 to number one on this list, my reasons for loving them become less and less cohesive because I feel like it's the very hardest to kind of talk about things that you love the most. Maybe that's just me. But the Poppy War series is about a fantasy world that is loosely based on our own world um, in like the early 20th century, but it has like a lot of differences, but it is very heavily inspired where it almost feels like historical fiction fantasy, even though it's set on a different world than our own. It is heavily, heavily inspired by real events that took place in China. This book follows Rin, who is a young peasant girl in the Nakara Empire, and in the Poppy War you follow her as she really puts her whole entire life on the line just in terms of her future and her limited career prospects and studies so hard and to the surprise of everyone gets into the most prestigious military school which is unheard of for people of her social standing or position. She is accepted into this school and is learning the art of warfare and quickly discovers that she has an affinity for shamanistic magic. There have long been kind of stories and tall tales about people who can call down the shamans from the heavens and use their powers themselves but that has largely just been considered a Myth until Rin realizes that she can call down the power of the phoenix fire goddess for herself. The Nakata Empire is one that is definitely war-torn. There have been several large-scale conflicts in the recent past and there is one brewing on the horizon right after Rin gets done with her schooling. She and all of her classmates are thrown into another poppy war and this one is seemingly going to be the biggest and most brutal war yet and they are thrown immediately from school and being children to war and having to grow up very fast and realizing the all too terrible realities of total war in which you are fighting for not just your country but your right to survive and be your own independent nation. So this is very heavily inspired on real life events in 20th century China and I feel like the Poppy War is especially infamous for some very very brutal scenes but unfortunately all of the gory horrific scenes in the Poppy War are rooted in real life atrocities that have happened in the past. So just keep that in mind. This is extremely gory um, and it's extremely brutal and it's extremely taxing. This story, unlike other fantasy war stories that I've read in the past, does not take place where you're training for a war, you're gathering up all your people, and then you're getting ready to fight the big bad war at the end. This starts in a very like much more realistic way in which there are large battles um, that you'd think would end the war but it doesn't and there are smaller ones and there are larger conflicts and it just really shows shows just how bloody and almost seemingly meaningless war can be and even how if you're fighting for just causes what ends justify your means um, and just how war can transform people into monsters. We deal with a lot a lot of heavy topics in here but this is very potentially like very triggering um, for you know gore and violence. This is a war story. This is a war fantasy and not once does Arf Kuang shy away from really depicting the horrors of a total war on an entire nation and effects that the war it could have even if the war is won, even if the whole entire conflict is won, how that doesn't necessarily translate to a better life or victory for everyone. Deals with colonialism and colorism and sexism and classism and lots of heavy heavy topics that are dealt with very very well. These characters are excellent. Um, I definitely feel like this cast of characters is going to stick with me for a long time because I feel like on paper um, they're not very likable at all so I feel like once I finished the Poppy War I really loved it hopped into the Dragon Republic but I considered like all of the characters pretty much to be very unlikable people but I really was drawn to the story and wanted to see where it went 
By like the midpoint of the Dragon Republic, I realized just how much these very unlikable characters and very realistic characters had grown on me. And that is just like an example of good writing because a lot of the characters they follow don't have a lot of redeeming qualities. Um, and they definitely don't shy away from making terrible decisions. And that's kind of the point of this whole trilogy is that, um, terrible decisions get made and sometimes like the greater good is not the immediate good and vice versa. There are a lot of tragic things that go into winning a war and these characters you just root for them and their lives are on the line and you're so nervous for them by the end of the Dragon Republic your heart's ripped out and you're like how can it get any better or any worse and then it simultaneously does and it's just so brilliantly done. The character arcs and the characterizations are just so wonderful. The conflict itself, the story, is equally strong in both plot and characterization. So the plot is absolutely enthralling. You're always wondering what is going to happen next, but there is enough time in between those really important plot points where you get characterization and really fall in love with these characters, even when you're not meaning to. And even if you don't fall in love with them, I think you're definitely going to have a lot of fun and are going to be very interested in reading about them because they're very interesting characters. I really enjoyed Rin's character arc in here and thought it was just brilliantly done. This book really cemented R.F. Kuang not only as the author of an amazing series that I absolutely love, but an autobi author. I am going to pick up anything this woman writes because I just, from each book, you can just see her craft getting better and better and better. And I'm so excited to see what she picks up next. I think she said, she mentioned something about writing like an academia book where it's like a direct response to the inherent colonialism of the buildings Roman um, or the traditional white rags to riches story. So I'm very excited to see what she has in store and I'm just, she's an autobi author. She's one of my favorite authors. This series, I absolutely love it. Like I have two full copies of these physical books and I have the audiobooks. I purchased the audiobooks as well. So that is how much I love this series. So there you have it guys. That is my top 10 favorite books of 2020. Uh, definitely a long one, but I hope you enjoyed. But that is going to be the end of this very, very long video. If you liked it, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below, and subscribe for more content from me. Stay safe, stay spooky, and I'll see y'all on the other side. Bye!